Hello and welcome to this edition of Northwest Profiles. I'm your host, Lynn Veltry, and I don't know about you, but with the arrival of daylight savings time and the promise of more sunshine, it seems as though feel-good stories abound. Case in point, over the next 30 minutes, our stories will take us back to the Victorian age, through fashion, Downton Abbey style. Expose us to the quirky world of a talented meme artist. Show us what it takes to groom a canine into a service dog. And finally, give us a chance to experience an art form whose canvas is eggshells. Sounds like a lot because it is a lot. So let's get rolling, shall we? Our region is a tapestry of history, and we're fortunate to have many organizations, museums, and even broadcasters like KSBS to connect us with history, both here and globally. In our first story, we weave all these things together as we see how Spokane's Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture has brought history to life through their latest exhibition called Dressing the Abbey. This exhibition is a traveling exhibition. It consists of 35 costumes that were featured in Downton Abbey. It also talks a little bit about the, that time in history from 1912 to um, the early 1920s. What people were wearing and how that shows the changing times. We're really looking to capitalize on our own collections and tell local stories, but maybe from that larger perspective of either a national or an international story like we have with the Downton Abbey exhibit. The Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture and neighboring Campbell House are windows into a vibrant past, linking historical global themes with regional topics. Exhibits like Pompeii, the Immortal City, have been paired with local tales about the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. More recently, the Campbell House has been presenting Spinning a Yarn, an exhibit of fashions and lifestyles of early Spokane. Meanwhile, the Mac has been featuring costumes from Downton Abbey. This was a fun one because as soon as we got a signed contract, uh, we jumped in and tried to start working with the Spokane Civic Theater on designing vignettes too, because this exhibition was just the costumes and the text panels, and so we wanted to make it come alive for our visitors. Jake Schaefer from the Civic Theater kind of compiled things into vignettes to make it a little bit more immersive. So the dining room table, for instance, was all him, his idea, and his team creating this dining scene. The kitchen scene, additionally, all the fake food and that sort of thing was from his team, which was lovely because that's not something that we have. So he made a really good effort to blend our collection with his props with the costumes. I don't think we've ever, to this degree, partnered with the Spokane Civic Theater, um, and so I was admittedly a little nervous at the beginning. Um, we had a really tight turnaround and to add a new voice to the table was a little scary, but it ended up being this amazing, amazing opportunity. For example, with the modernized fashions in the 1920s with the really cool white flowy fabric and the different colors, you know, he was playing with that and I knew I would love it but I had to wait to see it till the end, I guess. Because <laughs> he's got Im impeccable design taste, but it's so different from mine that it's best to, to sit on it for a minute, I think. <laughs> the globe is one of my favorite pieces that we got to bring out. It's a piece that was given to us by the Louis Davenport estate. If you look closely at the globe over there, you can see that someone has pointed at Spokane so many times that Spokane is basically obliterated from the globe. You can almost imagine people standing over and talking about their home and <laughs> pointing at it and making it basically go away. It's 
Spinning a Yarn was conceived as a companion for the Dressing the Abbey exhibit, and it really capitalizes on our, our largest uh, collection item here at the museum, and that is the historic Campbell House where we're sitting right now. The Campbell House was built in 1898 by Amesa and Grace Campbell. Today, the Campbell House is restored back to essentially what would have been uh, the house in about 1910 to kind of bring us back to life in the Campbells era. A lot of the costumes are ones that may have been on display before, so we know just a little bit about them, but this exhibit dove in a little bit deeper to say, okay, well, we know where this came from, we know who it belonged to, but who was that and, and what's the deeper story behind them? We do have stories here that are not just Spokane stories. We've got folks here in uh, Spinning a Yarn that come from Wilbur or in Reardon, so there's a, a little bit broader reach uh, throughout the Inland Northwest uh, that you'll, you'll encounter when you meet these characters. We also have a couple picture frames kind of scattered about, almost like Easter eggs. There's one at the intro, and there's a couple more, and they feature portraits from the Campbell family. And there's no labels, it's just kind of a fun little, another little poke. So we've got a picture of Helen in a fine dress, staring in a mirror in one scene. We've got a picture of the Campbell family trip to Egypt in another, and just kind of a fun little, another little poke to Ode to Campbell House. I have uh, fallen in love with these stories and these individuals. Um, they are stories that, you know, they're very personal. Um, each of the stories here uh, that you'll encounter in the house are, are tiny snapshots from that individual's life. And, and, you know, in some way I hope that we've been able to put some context around that to make people feel something. Dressing the Abbey and Spinning a Yarn have been part of the Mac Social Fabric series which shows the role that fashion has played in society through the years. Art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. That is a quote from Pablo Picasso, but it surely must also apply to the subject of our next story. Travis Chapman is a roofer by day, but when situated at his kitchen table, Travis the artist creates paintings that usually make a statement and even poke fun at his chosen subjects. Sitting at his kitchen table with a brush and some paint, Spokane's Travis Chapman, a roofing businessman by trade, weaves a quirky narrative in his paintings that oftentimes are meant to elicit a laugh or a nod, but will nearly always bring forth a response. Welcome to the world of a meme-friendly guy who revels in the fun of creating images that he says are opposing to an expected visual. It's relaxing to paint. I just like doing it. I like doing opposite things, like sometimes I would just paint something, and then I would think what would be funny to have in this picture that doesn't fit, sort of, or would be weird or, you know, strange and ironic. I don't know if it's a meme, but I like, I like movies, and in The Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi says there's no defense for the crane kick. So I had him going against Darth Vader, you know, because it's like he would never win, but there's no defense for this thing. And also against Jaws, like he's on a sinking boat, but he's gonna win because he's got this undefensible kick. What I found is you need to be able to see it within like two seconds because people are scrolling. If you don't catch them immediately, they're not gonna take the time to look at the description necessarily, so you've got to catch them quick. Travis strives to paint things that are pop culture oriented and relatable. Without formal training, he latched onto painting shows on television like Bob Ross in The Joy of Painting and the show Paint This with Jerry Yarnell on PBS. I did a painting called The Canvas Assassin and it's Bob Ross in the Bruce Lee pose with his shirt off and like the cut chest where he got cut in the movie, Enter the Dragon. Bob's holding the paintbrushes up like he's about to, you know, attack because he paints so fast that uh, he attacks. 
as a kid. I would watch like a guy Jerry Arnell on PBS and then, you know, Bob Ross. But Bob Ross paints so fast, it's almost like more of a show than to paint along with him. He would do a whole painting in like 20 minutes. Jerry Arnell I liked a lot. And he would teach you techniques, you know, still teaching you stuff. Travis's work graces the pages of online sites like Pinterest and Etsy, places that get a lot of attention and views, but interestingly, with tongue planted firmly into cheek, there was one unique place he initially thought would garner the most attention. Originally, I thought the best place for a painting is behind a urinal because you have to look, I mean, you, you can't even be on your phone. It's like, it's captive audience, but of course I'd rather have it in a more prestigious place, but that's like the most where someone will look at it and pay attention to it. I usually have an idea and then I start painting it and then it changes because it's like, oh, I put this too close to here or oh, there's a big space in the painting because I'm not that good at drawing stuff out before I do it. I did one where Quint from Jaws, the captain guy, is like pouring a beer in Jaws's mouth. I painted a Jaws painting and it, it was just Jaws in the ocean and it sat there for probably two weeks and I just kept looking at it, deciding what else to put in there. I was gonna have him be like a flamethrower and then I decided that Quint pouring a beer in his mouth and that's been like one of my most popular paintings. It could have went either way. I didn't have a plan at all. I just looked at it long enough and decided what I was gonna finish the painting with. And the best thing is if I can have an idea that's easy to paint, that's succinct, and you can get it really fast. Those are my favorite, but they don't come along that often. With a house full of his paintings, both on the walls and in storage, Travis keeps painting, creating, and uploading his images, hoping that his avocation of being an artist will supplant his current roofing business as his main profession. So I'm transitioning Slowly, I still have my roofing business to be a safety net, but I'm working harder and going deeper into art, and that's the goal. And I'm just uh, painting things I want to paint, and I figure if I want to paint them or I like the image or it's nostalgic for me, then it's gonna be nostalgic for somebody else and it's gonna make them feel like I feel when I look at that image. Up next, we change course from free expression through art to the rigid discipline of dog training. And for that, we turn to Corinne Wagaman, certified instructor and master trainer for canine police dogs, and for our story, service dogs. Corinne, with the help of her four-legged friend, Maple, happily shows off the skills needed for a dog to become a fun-loving and devoted comrade in service. That's part of having a service dog, right? They're not perfect, so they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna make mistakes. It was harder to train me than to train Shadow. Shadow has been quite a natural because, well, Corinne is a great trainer, but uh, it's the human. Excuse me, I'm speaking. <laughs> I am Corinne Wagaman, and I'm the owner and head trainer of Nine Realms Canine Training, specializing in police canines and service dogs. Hi, Mabel. So I went to Carroll College in Helena, Montana, and I got a degree in anthrozoology, and anthrozoology is the study of the human-animal bond. I then proceeded to um, do some online schooling through London Hanover University, and I got a master's degree in canine behavioral sciences. When I went to college, we got to foster a dog for a year, and for that year, it was a rescue dog. You got to train the dog in whatever sort of behaviors you wish to train the dog for. So I decided to train that dog in narcotics detection as well as service tasks. So we did tasks such as walking next to a wheelchair, picking up objects, pressing handicap buttons, going and finding help, sound alerts for people who maybe are hard of hearing, and that dog learned all of those tasks as I was learning to teach all of those tasks. So that's where I got my start in the service dog world. Um, and then when I started the business, I realized the need for people who are owner training their own service dogs. Service dogs are very expensive, right? And not a lot of people can afford to go get one. And the wait list for program dogs where you get a dog for free is sometimes five years. So it's just not realistic sometimes to get a program dog. 
But if you have a really nice dog and you're willing to do the training yourself, you can partner with a trainer like myself and learn and owner train your dog. So that's when I really started getting into helping um, people like Elodie train her own dog for service work. I wanted him to be a service dog, but Corinne from uh, Nine Realms uh, interviewed him, so to speak, and evaluated him. And she saw the potential in him. And that's how she took him on as a client. It took us a year with intensive training with Corinne one-on-one. -on -one. So this boy went from almost being uh, put down to rescue to service dog. Want to grab the wallet? Stay. Okay. Bring. Add a girl. Bring it here. Good job, Maple. The Americans with Disability Act only states that a service dog is a service dog if it's task trained to help mitigate a handler with a disability. No sort of certification is required and people who say my dog is service dog certified, usually it's a little bit of a red flag, but you can still have a dog that's certified through an organization, performing tasks, right, helping its handler, and it's a legit dog. You really want to look for a dog that's focused on their handler. You don't want a dog that's more interested in the world that's going on, other animals, or a dog that just doesn't really care about their people. So you look for a dog that already has a bond, right? And that's the first thing I ask. How do you feel your bond is with your dog? And if they're like, he doesn't care about me, eh, usually a red flag. And then we're testing to see if the dog's social in public, if they're fine with other people, if they're fine with other dogs, if they're uh, nervous in new environments. If they are, they're not gonna make a good service dog. And then from there, you start your training with basic obedience, start adding in tasks and advanced obedience. And actually along the way, it's generally when you start to see whether or not the dog's truly gonna make it. So you can do all your initial evaluation, dog can look fine. And then as you start to train, the dog's like, I don't like this career, it's not for me. And then you have some dogs that you start and you're like, well, it doesn't look great. And then they really start to blossom. And you're like, oh, you made it. Look at that. You're doing great. Take it. Take it. So Maple is about a year and a half, almost a two, Thank yellow lab. She was donated by a lovely Labrador Retriever breeder out here at six months of age. Um, and she's been puppy raised by some good um, folks and friends of mine for the past year and a half and she is going off to Texas with her handler, who is an 18-year-old girl in a wheelchair. So she's trying to pick up objects, open cabinets, go get help, press the handicap button, help her take off her jacket, take off shoes, turn on lights, you name it, she's trained to do. And this is probably one of those one in a million dogs. Every trainer says, you know, like, there's those dogs that really change your life that you know are really, really special. And this is, this is one of those dogs, definitely. That maple heel. Mabel understands her heel command incredibly well, right? And she heel backs up with it. She goes forward, heel. And she turns nicely so that heel, her person who's in a wheelchair, right, isn't having to constantly use her leash to guide her around. She's just using her verbal or her body position, heel, to move the dog around with her. Atta girl. So dogs that work with either people um, that have autism or children that have autism have a very tough mentally in a way that like all of that emotion that's coming through their handler or that child isn't going to affect them. They're not going to absorb that, but they're also able to pick up on that person's needs and desires and then go and assist them, comfort them. So there's this fine line between overly stressed about your handler, right, and not paying enough attention. I and mean, these dogs, they, they pick up on either physical movements that their handlers are doing or just their voice inflections. <laughs> so Maple wouldn't make a good autism service dog, even though she's already a trained service dog for somebody else because she's too sensitive. She picks up on all of her handler's emotions and she takes them in, which makes her a good dog in that she picks up on it and she goes and she assists them. She sits by their lap, she naturally alerts, but then she starts to become anxious and insecure. And over time, she needs her own service dog, right? So you have to have a dog that feels those emotions that the handler's feeling, but then also isn't constantly absorbing them and becoming stressed as well. So I think that's the real special thing about autism service dogs. I can take him where I go without any problems. Life is less scary with shadow in it. And I do have a constant partner. 
I've always wanted to help people. So it just seemed like the logical fit when I first stumble upon service dog as a young, young kid. I love seeing every minute that I see these dogs change people's lives. That's really what I live for and that's why I do it. Corinne's expertise includes training any poaching dogs. Four of them are currently on duty at a Tanzania game reserve, tracking poachers that smuggle illegal wildlife products such as ivory, hippo teeth, and rhino horn. Amazing what dogs can do. Now for our final story, we return to the world of artistic expression. These days, we're surrounded by elaborate visual images, often created with computers and apps. But right now, let's meet a Calgary artist whose hand-drawn designs are not only complex and beautiful, but are steeped in culture and history. Every line, every color it has a different meaning, has different symbolism, so you can actually write a story. If you want fertility or if you want love, health, you can all put it on an egg. Pesenka is the art of Ukrainian Easter eggs. Uh, it's a pre-Christian tradition for the Ukrainian culture. It's done in the spring and is a symbol of life, and now we do them for Easter as well. It's Easter being Pesenka, everybody pretty much does them for their basket at Easter. It's mostly to promote the culture, what we do in the community, how vibrant our community is, to teach people about the piss and care. Calgary artist Dana Didak uses real eggs for her art. Usually the yolks are blown out beforehand. To color the eggs, Dana first draws melted wax onto some areas, covering them so that they'll stay protected while the colored dye only goes to the areas that she wants. The next step on this pisanka would be to cover over the red star area, so the middle section, with wax and cover just the red spots where we want to keep red. Then I would put it into a black dye for the black background, take the wax off, and that would be a traditional pisanka. I actually find it very relaxing. For me, I learned in school. It was part of the actual school system in Saskatoon, the only one in Saskatchewan. So this is an example of more traditional designs from Ukraine, so they're more simplistic, usually only a couple of colors as well. So these are more modern versions of Piss and Ke, and so this is a version of the modern colors and the modern look, um, so very different from the traditional style. This is the Tripillion style of Piss and Kiss. So they were originally on pottery and very prehistoric culture from Ukraine. And I'm kind of known for the Tripillion style, so I do quite a few of these. And they're done on brown eggs as well, so they look more like the pottery. This is another modern style that we've been using. So these eggs are off-white. So the one in the back is actually a brown egg. The one in the middle is a brown egg and they've been treated with acid to take away the brown color. The one in the back has been dyed and the other eggs are actually, that's their natural shell color. So you can get light green eggs, you can get beige eggs, you can get different tones of brown and blue. And there's been some pink. I haven't had those in a while. I have everything from quail eggs that I've got at home. I've got pheasant, chicken. I've got uh, emu eggs. I've got ostrich. I've got duck and goose and turkey. The pisanka in the middle 
is a chicken egg, and that would be probably a medium-sized chicken egg. The little star one in the front is actually a tiny, tiny chicken egg that I got from someone. The two other smaller eggs are pheasant, and the two in the back are either small goose eggs or turkey. In Canada and US and across the world, we have a whole bunch of different artists that we keep in touch online, get together in groups and have little play dates and workshops and retreats. And every single egg that I see that people make, even if it's a beginner or not, everyone's beautiful. Dana confesses she doesn't know exactly how long it takes to create one of her eggs. But the larger, more intricate designs can take up to 30 hours to create one egg. And with those beautiful images fresh in our minds, I do believe it's time to turn the page and close out this edition of Northwest Profiles. Please note, if you would like to learn more about the stories you've just seen, simply go online to ksps.org. Until we meet again, this is Lynn Valtry saying so long and reminding you, here in the Inland Northwest and Western Canada, there's always a full supply of adventure, so venture out. And when you do in this age of COVID, do it safely and take time to enjoy the view.